بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبيجن the name of Allah all praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad and his family and his companions and all those who adhere to his guidance and we ask Allah to make us and you among the best of those who adhere to his guidance we complain to Allah Azza wa Jal the abundance of our wounds as an ummah and our scattered populations and our internal strife and disunity and we admit to him and express to him and renew in front of him our conviction, our certainty that he is certainly capable of fixing all of that. I have four suggestions as to how to respond to, think about the where do we turn now question. But allow me to begin with an anecdote, uh, a story that I was reflecting on uh, in my Jum'ah prep a week or two ago and it was an incident uh, that has many parallels. There's a sister that came complaining of her uh, vicious cycles of marital conflict. And she's like wondering, why does this keep happening to me? And like, when am I finally gonna be able to like break the, the cycle and like fix it, Sheikh, type thing, right? <laughs> And before I could, you know, extend my advice to her, she gave an important disclaimer. She said, and listen, please don't tell me the standard sheikh stuff, okay? Don't tell me I got problems in my life because I'm not religious, and if I start becoming religious, and it's because I don't pray my five that I'm sort of always fighting with my husband, I'm not going to buy it. Just let you know up front. <laughs> because uh, I know many people who aren't religious, who aren't even Muslim, who have wonderful marriages. And so that can't be it. And so I, I sent her a message and I said to her, like, hold up, just give me a minute. First of all, you don't actually know that they have happy marriages. They could be flaunting a highlight reel on social media somewhere and you'll get their divorce notification soon enough, right? Number two, it is also very possible that they have a relatively better marital relationship, right? than you, and that is because Allah loves you. Because most human beings only come back between a rock and a hard place, and Allah knows that if He gives you what you want, you will drift from Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So maybe this is your bitter medicine. I'm not saying it can't be remedied, but don't try to equate or compare apples and oranges. The Muslim, the believer, the sincere person, the ummah, they are different in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so at times the treatment comes a little bit different. Because he loves you, he may cause the consequence to come immediately at you so you can make the connection quickly while you can still U-turn, while you still have a chance. You know what Fudayl ibn Iyad, rahimahullah, a great early scholar of Islam, he used to say, Every time I disobey Allah, I recognize that in my wife and in my, my ride, basically, my riding animal, my camel or my, my horse, right? Basically, I go home, I got problems, I step outside into my vehicle, I got problems, there's always problems. Uh, there's no running from my problems, whenever, but it's immediately after I disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Allah's love for al-fudayl. That is the correct way to understand this. And so at times the ummah, uh, is treated differently by Allah, it receives painful injections, <laughs> vitality boosters that sting, so that we can have a better chance at self-correcting, because there's no unlimited grace period, is there? We can self-correct, try to get uh, in better standing, and so in that sense, these difficulties on the individual or on the ummah at large are a sign of Allah's love for this ummah. Very important to frame the conversation this way. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even said this. He said, Ummati hadihi ummatun marhuma, laysa laha adabun fil akhira, adabuha fi dunya, al fitanu, wal katlu, wal zalazil. That this ummah of mine, this global community of believers in Allah and His Messenger, is an ummah that has been granted a distinct share, an extra share of Allah's mercy, Allah's compassion, 
Then he explains how. He says, because it doesn't get punished in the hereafter, meaning in the same way, to the same extent as other nations, its punishment comes in the immediate, in this world, in the form of fitan, fitan is like chaos, anarchy, والقتل, and killing, being killed, والزلازل, and, uh, and earthquakes. And so the point of this, for this ummah, is for us to flee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to answer, the first of the four answers of where do we turn? We turn to Allah first and foremost. فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ As Allah Azza wa Jal said, so flee to Allah. Allah is the only one that you flee from Him to Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we don't flee to Allah in our moments of pain, then when would we ever? Right? Like the Quran actually tells you that things could get better presumptively so, in terms of the immediate worldly life, once you drift farther, you want to be deluded, he will allow you to confirm your biases and continue down that path. May Allah protect us. Say Ameen. Amen. The Quran says, فَلَوْلَ إِذْ جَاءَتْهُمْ بَأْسُنَا إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا تَضَرَّعُوا وَلَكِنْ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Why is it that when our suffering came to them, our destiny that they go through some suffering came to them why is it that they did not humble themselves meaning come back to God then he answers it for you and he said this is the Quran the Quran is amazing the Quran is an open book test right you ever heard that before I didn't make it up but it's a very true statement right it, it tells you the answer to the test in the book he says but here's the reason why they didn't get humble even during suffering like if you're not gonna get humble in suffering most people fail the test of gratitude more people pass the test of what? Of tribulation, patience, right? So why didn't they humble themselves? He says, but their hearts had become too hard. And shaitan, the devil, had beautified for them what they're doing. There is a shortcut. Don't give me the sheikh answer. There's got to be a quick fix, right? That's the idea. Do you know what the very next verse is in this discussion? How much time do I have, by the way? That's important. 10, 10, 12, 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to behave, inshallah. The very next verse says what? After why is it that when our suffering came to them, they did not get humbled, it's because their hearts were hard and shaitan beautified for them their actions. Allah says, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ And then, when they forgot, they kept ignoring the wake-up calls, they kept ignoring the notifications that Allah gives them to make the connections, right? To self-correct. When they forgot all of the reminders, what did Allah do? فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ We opened up for them the floodgates of everything. You want fame? Here's fame. You want money? Here's money. You want status? Here's status. You want a happy marriage? Between quotes? Go ahead. You can have that too. Live it up. It's all you have. All you have is the here and now. All you have is the drop. I am now with disqualifying you from the ocean. Right? That's the, Allah says when they forgot, after the suffering came, didn't wake up, hearts were too hard, you continued to forget, here you go. We opened up for them the floodgates of everything. Hatta ida farihu bima utu, and then they became deluded with this little, the lowly offer of this world. Akhadna hum baghtatan fa ida hum mublisun. We suddenly snatched them away, meaning they hit the wall of death at full speed. Right? We snatched them baghtatan suddenly. Wa hum la wa hum mublisun in a state of despair. Because there's why despair? Because there's no chance to correct after you've departed. The, that train is gone. So the first thing is you return to Allah Azza wa Jal, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, you know, people ask the question, like, why is it taking so long, this whole massacre in Gaza? Of course it is painful. Of course we're supposed to fight destiny with destiny. See if it's in our destiny to put an end to this. Of course, yes. But if it's ultimately destined that it take longer than it ever has, and it has, maybe it's because Allah knows we need a bit longer to finally wake up, to finally reform, to finally get crystallized for us. How worthless this life is. How incredible true faith and resilience that they exemplify is. Maybe we need it. Maybe Allah knows we'll never do it without it. And so return to Allah Azza wa Jal, that's who we turn to number one. Number two, and I'll accelerate now. Turning to each other. There is actually a, a phenomenon in the Quran that is truly amazing. 
that whenever Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about his support for the believers, like worldly support, like when the prophets are being persecuted, he always says, I sent angels, and the angels were not sent to give you victory. These are just like reassurances for your heart, maybe to strike fear in your enemy, get them to like create some self-doubt in them, right? But victory is only from Allah. That's what the ayat always say. Battle of Badr, we send angels. But victory is only from Allah. Battle of Uhud, we send angels. But victory, it always has this disclaimer. Victory is only from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that your heart never leans or trusts any created being. It is the creator. He is the ultimate factor, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there is one ayah in the Quran that's almost like a, a, an anomaly or like a, a little bit of an exception to this. Allah says, he is the one who gave you support, O Muhammad, O Prophet, with his unique aid and with the believers. That doesn't mean the believers are helping Allah and they sort of co-sponsored the victory. No. Allah is identifying for you how he helped you. So it's ultimately from him. But you need to really know that this is how I send my, dua, my response to your dua. The ummah, the ummah turning to each other. That's number two. And it's truly a big subject, like to care about the ummah. And that, that's a lecture on its own, because how do you balance between caring locally and globally? It's a big subject. But also collaborating with those within reach. And also praying for those that you can't collaborate with. They're too far, or they're too far-minded from you. You pray for them. That's a big part of it. This idea that the ummah has the luxury to not be united is a big problem. It's delusion. And the Prophet ﷺ said that this will always be one of our ongoing repeated tests. He said, I asked my Lord to never wipe out this ummah with a famine, and he promised me it would never happen. And to never wipe out my nation, with an external enemy that would be unleashed against it. And he said to me, if the whole world were to unite against your ummah, they would not be able to eradicate it. This ummah, no one will ever write the obituary of the ummah. It will never die. There were so many moments in Islamic history, in the world history, when you would say, it's over. And then those who were about to put the nail in the coffin on this ummah became Muslim and they became the new ummah. The conquerors, their hearts were conquered by Islam. Right? These were the two. But here's the part that hurts. The one that, speaking of our internal strife. He said, And I asked my Lord to not allow the hostilities of my ummah to be one with another in fighting. And he withheld that one from me. That's going to be, it doesn't mean it has to happen at all places and all times. Right? But it is, this is going to be our, our virus that we have to continue working against. And this is a difficult one, right? We are not outnumbered, as you know, right? We are, as they say, out-organized, out-mobilized. If we can't be you know, organized uh, like in our bodies or in terms of our finances yet, let's at least start with the organization of our hearts, the alignment of the hearts. Never allow yourself to resent a fellow Muslim. Never allow yourself to undermine another Muslim who's doing good work, right? Even if you don't agree with them, it's okay. They could be reaching pockets of society that you have failed to reach. So stop being an idealist, like there's actually an alternative, right? And many a times, if we would know our limits, we would realize that what they're doing is possibly right and what we're doing is actually wrong. These are matters of speculation. These are not matters of Allah is one, Muhammad's the Prophet, Quran's his book, Salah's five times. It. Those things are non-negotiables. But all the other stuff, right? The strategies that the Ummah gets involved in, the passion projects, right? Their roles, their lanes in the highway, leave all that alone. Don't undermine their work. That's a big challenge. So where to? Turn to Allah and turn to each other. You guys ready for the crazy one? The bombshell one? You ready for me to be extra dramatic? Number three, where to turn? Turn to the Zionists. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> Not because they're our teachers, but because Allah may teach us through them. The Zionists are not just outwardly always a united front. 
The Zionists also have a lot of great stamina. And you need it. You need to stop thinking anything will change of meaningful, positive change overnight. Do you think overnight the Zionists were able to get 38 states in this country to pass by sort of legislation or executive order anti-BDS laws? Where me working in a hospital could lose my job if I post on social media to not buy from this company? No, they clocked it early and worked on it for years that the power in this world was shifting from governments to corporations. So they went after the corporations. And this is their achievement thus far. 40 years before that, and I shared this recently, and I'm sorry if you're hearing it for the second time, but the Quran repeats itself, so why can't I? Humans are forgetful. In 1963, they went after the governments. They created APAC. APAC is the lobby group. It's an interest group. Genius, isn't it? In a sinister, satanic sort of way, isn't it? Right? APAC is the American-Israeli Public Affairs Commission. Basically, the, the bribery commission for the genocide apartheid project, right? This way, I can ensure with about a billion dollars a year, whoever's in power doesn't really matter. They're going to sort of trip over themselves and trip over each other trying to posture for me, right? I spend a billion dollars, and if a war breaks out, by the way, for those that just woke up recently, we're happy that you're awake. Welcome. But this is the fifth war on Gaza in the last 20 years. Unprecedented numbers of casualties and... May Allah accept all of our martyrs. Fifth one. But every time a war breaks out, every few months, we're going to get $14 billion. Why? Because we spent a billion dollars. That's good work. Right or wrong? That was 40 years ago. Before 1963. Well, that's not 40 years ago, is it? That's 60 years ago. 40 years before that, that's where the 40 was coming. 40 years before that in 1924, 24 years before the establishment of the Israeli state, they had established a world union of Jewish students. Of course, only if they were Zionist inclined. And they brought some of the top intellectuals of the world. The first president of the world union of Jewish students was who? Albert Einstein. The vice president was Chaim Weizmann, who became the first president of Israel in 48. He was a world-class chemist that the whole world was competing for his attention because they needed his invention to accelerate their production of bombs for World War I. Sigmund Freud, Sigmund Freud was, uh, was part of the leadership as well, right? By the way, and I always have to say this, that's why they're losing their minds, that out of the campuses of all places, the project is falling apart. But you know what happened even nearly 30 years before 1924? It all started with the media. And that is why they are making one mistake after another, underestimating what social media has done of breaking the monopoly on the narrative. Through social media, the mainstream monopoly is gone because they started on it 130 years ago. The, the state of Israel was a white paper that was put together by Theodore Herzl, an atheist, Zionist, journalist, and diplomat, right? So there's a lot to learn there. I'm not here telling you Anything but the fact that Allah does not play favoritism. You got to put in the work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَدَّرَ فِيهَا أَقْوَاتَهَا فِي أَرْبَعَةِ أَيَّامٍ سَوَاءً لِلسَّائِلِينَ I have embedded into this earth its provisions over the span of four days. Allah could have done it instantly. He wants you to know that the nature of this world, the way I created it, things take time. They went, it took four days to put it in. Because I chose for you to understand how this world works. It may take you 40 years to pull it out, to extract it and, and leverage it. But you need to leverage it. You need to get power and not get corrupted by power in the process. It's work. And that's the last one, actually. The last one is to turn to ourselves. Getting power, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Who's ever heard that? that is, that's going to be the X factor. That is the ultimate game changer. To have the courage to look at yourself, to turn to yourself and say, how am I part of the problem? Because the easiest thing to do and the most cowardly thing to do is to always project blame. It's the Muslims or the Muslim governments or the lobbies or sort of the, the spineless uh, politician. It's, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. And there's a lot of blame to be shared, of course. But to project blame is easy. To inspect yourself for what part of the blame is on me that is the X factor. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran 
always calls us to zoom in. Allah does not change the condition of a people, the Quran says, until they can change what is within themselves. Zoom in from the collective to the individual. Which one of you, don't answer, <laughs> and I'm done here. Which one of you believes that if the whole ummah was like them, we'd be in a better place? If you say me, then you're the biggest problem we have right now. And if you say not me, then own it. Let's get to work, right? To not worship our egos. To not assume that we are not mini tyrants in our little corners of the world. You know, we always want to talk about the powers that be and the global issues and tyrants. Allah said in the Quran that one of the first things he made, Jesus, peace be upon him, say, in the cradle was what? He made me dutiful to my mother. And he has made me one that is not tyrannical. Meaning with my mom. What do tyrants do? They make people beg. How many times does your mom, has to re mom have to repeat herself? You're making her beg. May Allah forgive us and you and, and our words that don't match our actions. Tyrants make people serve them. How long have our parents been serving us? Right? When will we start serving them? Once those turn to Allah, turn to each other, turn to learn from the, 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 the cosmic order Allah has chosen, Zionists are, are our, were our exhibit A today, and turn to yourselves. If we do that, know that Allah has changed the formation of this planet for one man who repented, the man who committed the hundred murders. You all know his story. And even in the story of Moses, peace be upon him, it was one man, right? Allah took a young boy that was a foundling, that was picked up out of a basket, and developed a speech impediment, right? He became the spokesperson for a nation and hid their savior from slavery. Right or wrong? So it all begins with an individual. That individual, we all have to say, I am that individual. May Allah Azza wa forgive us and write for us the best of this world and the next and make us all instruments of his justice and of his good for this ummah and the world at large and their well-being. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka anabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakallahu khairan.